Um, thank you very much for having me here. I'd like to particularly thank the organizers for scheduling me, so I'm the only thing standing between you and drinks, and, um, and this means that I have a very powerful incentive not to run over, so I'll try not to run over. So um, I'd like to begin by talking about a really important difference between um, the way um, we think about experiments in condensed matter systems and the way we've been told to think about experiments in NISC systems. So in condensed matter systems, traditionally, there's not very much you can measure. Um, whereas um, in NISC systems, of course, as John Freskill said, um, you measure first, ask questions later. And what I'd like to address here is what questions do we want to be asking about, um, um, about these systems that, um, you know, first of all, we couldn't have addressed uh, easily in condensed matter. And, um, and second, um, that I couldn't have generated in my laptop. So um, one natural place to look is, um, is many body quantum dynamics, um, you know, uh, a, a chaotic Hamiltonian or a random circuit or anything like that. You know that um, the complexity of representing a state after um, t time step scales exponentially in time um, for a sufficiently big system. And, um, and so, um, so you need exponential resources. And you might say, you know, this is a very hard problem. What can we say about it? Now, if you went back to, I don't know, Landau and said, oh, this you know, problem of many body physics, of many body dynamics at high temperatures is very hard, he'd have said, well, that's ridiculous. Um, it's all just like you know, water flowing in a pipe. Yeah, you can't come up with a microscopic theory of it. Um, but of course, that's just thinking about the problem the wrong way. Um, the correct way to think about it is using the principles of hydrodynamics and the logic behind hydrodynamics, these three formulated um, as we think about it nowadays, is to say, look, any sufficiently complex evolution is effectively a random matrix subject to constraints from locality, conservation laws, and things like that. And so a system goes to, um, the, to as complex a state as it could subject to these conservation laws. And if you assume that this, this process called thermalization happens locally, then you don't have to deal with the complexity of the state. You just say, OK, you chop your system up into bits. Each bit is described by a, um, uh, by a temperature and a chemical potential. And then you have to write down equations of motion for these few parameters that you have left. Um, and, um, and you can do that in a gradient expansion in some systematic way. And um, if, you, if you carry out this program, um, for lattice models in one dimension at finite temperature, the only thing you're allowed to get out is diffusion of any conserved quantity. Now, that's the prediction. Does it work? Um, you know, back then, it would have been hard to check because you didn't have isolated systems so much. But um, over the past 20 years, um, in cold atomic systems and now other NIST devices, um, we've looked into this extensively. And the answer is, yeah, maybe. Sometimes it works. but in a large number of cases, it, um, it doesn't. Um, and um, the, this program, hydrodynamics, doesn't get, it just fails to get off the ground because the system doesn't um, even approach thermal equilibrium. And, uh, and these systems that don't approach thermal equilibrium have a few features in common. Um, they're, they're fairly diverse, but, um, but there's a common theme that um, all of them have um, long-lived excitations that interact with each other. Um, and you have to deal with the interactions, they're also present at finite and fairly high density, right? And so, so that's, that's the problem you have to deal with. And so this hydrodynamic program um, requires revision, and it's actually worth looking at the problem um, from, a, um, from a more sort of uh, microscopic perspective. OK. To motivate what I'm going to say next, I need to briefly introduce um, this um, central concept um, which is the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And, um, and the way ETH works is you, um, is, is you reason as follows. You had initial state, and the initial state is some you know, very complicated superposition in the eigenbasis. Um, and um, because it's got some very specific phase relations, it's out of equilibrium. Then you let it go, and after a while, um, um, the phase relations get scrambled. And then all you have left is um, essentially a mixture of, um, of, 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 um, of thermal states, of, of eigenstates um, from a certain energy window. Um, and, um, and so the idea is that, um, that in, a, um, in a system that equilibrates, um, the eigenstates um, 
uh, of, uh, of an approximately the same energy are locally indistinguishable. They all look the same to local measurements. And so this is sort of codified in these um, two um, hypotheses. The first is um, for expectation values. And the second concerns the off-diagonal matrix elements of, of local operators. And, um, and so I'd say that, um, that diagonal ETH is kind of rigid and there's not very much you can do about it. But off-diagonal ETH is a bit floppy because all that it's saying um, is that, um, is that, um, um, that the off-diagonal matrix elements, of course, you can um, repackage using the Kubo formula um, and connect to things like response functions. And so if the response function behaves sensibly as hydrodynamics predicts, that imposes um, constraints on what, this, um, what the variance of these, um, of these off-diagonal matrix elements has to be um, inside um, some energy window. Um, but notice that um, it only really constrains the variance. The remaining moments of this distribution um, could really be um, a wide number of different um, possibilities, and the, um, the simplest hypothesis that, that was made by Shednishki and others um, needn't really be true. So, okay, um, and so it's so one thing to, to appreciate, I think it's not fully appreciated in general, is that linear response doesn't really test um, off-diagonal ETH, it doesn't really test thermalization at all, um, because it's, um, it's built in to the structure of the thing. Um, okay, so um, to see why linear response is blind to a lot of the stuff, let's think about measuring the, um, the linear response of a metal versus, um, say, an Anderson insulator. Um, so, um, when, so the way you measure an AC conductivity, I want you to think about is just you stick your system between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor and you drive a, um, an oscillatory electric field. Um, and, um, and so what happens to you is the metal is just absorbs energy weakly everywhere. When you do the same thing in an insulator, most of it is completely inert, but every, 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 here, uh, every so often the sample, you're, you come across these um, local two-level systems that are resonant to the drive, and they absorb really strongly. And so um, the actual total absorption at early times, which is what linear response gives you, is actually the same. It behaves the same in both phases. Um, the, the differences come in, in when the response saturates, because minutes later you fry your two-level systems, they stop responding, whereas in a metal they just keep going forever. Um, okay, so, um, so that, that's, that's suggestive. There's, you know, there's life beyond linear response. Um, and, um, and so how do you probe this in general? Um, in the simple example of the, um, of the, the insulator with localized excitations, um, you can use um, approaches like pump probe spectroscopy where you whack the system um, very hard and then wait a bit and see if, um, if it remembers you whacked it. If, it, if it's, yeah, anyway, go ahead. Uh, no, I'm, I'm keeping, uh, so I'll come back to the slide, but right now I'm keeping, the, I'm keeping the frequency fixed, and I'm saying that, like, in some frequency window, it's not too close to zero, both these things just have some featureless um, AC conductivity. I, but I'll come back to that in just one slide, okay? Um, right, um, and so, so in, in pump probe spectroscopy, you can actually deconvolve these things because um, I don't have time to go into it, but, um, but they're sort of, um, but there's two time differences. There's the time between the whacking and, um, and, the, and, 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 and when you sort of gently probe the system, and there's the time between when you gently probe the system and when you saw um, if, if you were responding to gentle probe. And so, so this, this, the fact you have these two times allows you to deconvolve um, what um, an atomic physicist would call inhomogeneous versus homogeneous broadening of the spectral function. Um, all right. Um, and so this, this works um, in the simple case um, where the quasi-particles are localized, so it's very easy to couple to quasi-particles locally. But in general, um, if you have quasi-particles like an integrable system that are delocalized, it's not so obvious that um, it would work at all. Um, and, um, and so, you know, can, uh, can you make it work? Um, not in any simple, condensed matter accessible way, um, though we have some preliminary ideas in this paper, which I don't have time to get to. But yeah, to get back to, I think, the question that Ehud was um, uh, getting at, um, you can ask this question, are there two different um, phases? Are there different systems with qualitatively different dynamics 
but the same linear response functions. Um, and that's not really true in the Anders insulator because it turns out the low frequency conductivity has this um, universal form that diagnoses the insulator. But, um, but what I'm going to present today is an example of a uh, phase um, with the same spectral functions as just a boring diffusive phase, but very different higher order fluctuations. Um, okay. Um, fine. And so um, to do that, I'm going to go away from um, condensed matter notions of nonlinear response, and I'm going to um, use um, quantum gas microscopy um, and you know global measurements of a system as my way of um, as, as my way into computing nonlinear response. And so um, this is motivated um, by um, experiments in Emmanuel Bloch's group, um, where what he does is he takes uh, a system. This is really a, a set of parallel one-dimensional wires, and he starts out um, the system in the state where you have a definite number of particles in the left half and another definite number of particles in the right half. Um, and then um, you, you let the system go at some time, um, and, um, and, 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 and you see the full distribution function of the particles that have crossed from the left to the right. And so you can, start, you can do this either in equilibrium state, the left and right are the same um, chemical potential, um, or you can do this um, in a state where there's a different density on the left and the right. Okay, um, and um, and so, right. So so one thing, one important point that um, that I think um, Tomas Prezen pointed out a few years ago is that in the limit where um, the the left and the right densities are very close to each other, um, the average number of particles um, that um, passes through the barrier um, is proportional to linear response transport coefficient. But in general, there's there's, there's more content to it, of course. Um, okay, so. Um, right, so in, what, what do we expect this thing to do if the system is boring and diffusive? Um, so what we'd expect is both the mean and the variance scale as the square root of time. The mean scale is the square root of time because that's the number of particles that have crossed the barrier, typically if particles are moving diffusively. Um, the variance um, scales as um, square root of time because, um, you know, by the time, but because the particle density is equilibrated over a distance that scales the square root of time, and the square root fluctuations in a square root distance are t to the one fourth, and so that's that's what you expect to see um, in a um, diffusive system. And you don't have to take my word for it because um, Derrida went and computed this, and, he, and there's a there's an expression for the full distribution function. One thing I'd like to point out about this distribution function is that even though the problem they're looking at was just a bunch of random walkers. Um, where the hardcore constraints, you can't put two guys on the same site. So even though the model was um, very simple and almost just, bo just as vanilla diffusion as you could get, um, in fact, um, this distribution function is non-trivial even in that case. So it, it, it knows that, um, that, the that the symmetric exclusion process is different from diffusion. So I, I just wanted to say that in passing. Um, okay, the model I'm going to talk about today, though, is not um, the, the set. It's something where the deviations are much more violent. And that's the XXZ spin chain, which um, a couple of people have mentioned. And it's sort of this um, fruit fly model of many body dynamics, because it's basically the simplest thing you could um, write down um, and actually experimentally irrelevant. Um, there's sort of a long story um, about the dynamics of this model as a function of delta. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today um, primarily is the limit where delta is very large. And so where delta is very large, essentially the Hamiltonian is dominated by this um, Ising interaction between neighboring spins. And, um, and so what the Ising interaction does is it conserves the number of domain walls under the dynamics because, uh, because changing the number of domain walls incurs too much um, of an energy cost. Um, and so what you can do is you can perform a standard perturbative elimination of, um, of the, the delta term that gives you this um, projected Hamiltonian um, that allows particles to hop um, as long as they don't um, change the number of domain walls um, in the process of hopping, okay? So that's, um, that's, the, that's the physics, that's the model, and, um, and so a couple of obvious points. So if you take, if you take something like an all-down state um, and you put in a single upspin 
the thing Lutzpin can hop around um, unimpeded because it doesn't violate this projector, whereas any combination, any, any set of spins are next to each other that um, are all pointing in the same direction is frozen because you can't move them around without creating um, domain walls. Um, okay, so that's, um, that, that, that's the content for quasi-particles, this model, and the reason why it's meaningful to think about these quasi-particles is the model is integral, so in fact, um, these quasi-particles are infinitely long-lived. So to tell you what happens dynamically in the system, the one other thing I need to discuss is what happens when a small mobile object hits a large immobile object, and you can just sort of, um, it's, it's illustrated in this picture, the, the small guy comes in, walks in, doesn't do anything until here, when it gets to here, it has a problem because it's got to decide what to do next. If it just keeps moving as a black square, then it's going to um, change the number of domain walls, and that's no good. So the, and the model is integral, so it can't just reflect off, the, off the, the wall. So what it has to do is it has to propagate through the other domain by changing its polarity. Okay? So even though these quasi-particles are moving ballistically, um, as they propagate through the system, they're up half the time and down half the time, and so they're not transporting any spin. Um, and, and so um, there's no ballistic transport. Instead, the thing that's governing the transport is the fact that um, when a magnon sweeps through a domain, through a frozen domain, it, um, it um, makes the domain jitter in the opposite direction to when the magnon came in. So um, over time, the domain undergoes Brownian motion as magnons keep um, whacking it from the left and the right. Um, okay. And so this is um, all we need to know in order to think about what happens um, to the model when you sort of start out most of the spins um, up on the left and most of the spins down on the right, but some small density of, um, of, of, of excitations. So these excitations float around. You have this big domain wall that starts out at the origin. Um, and um, and as, as, as particles move through this, um, the domain moves um, and undergoes a random walk. Um, and, um, and so the key thing, the key observation here, which you can sort of see from both of these um, by keeping track of um, the accounting of, um, of spin, is that the magnetization transfer um, goes as, um, you know, when the, when the domain wall moves, when the domain wall moves toward the origin, um, the magnetization transfer decreases. When the domain wall moves away from the origin, the, um, the magnetization transfer increases. And, um, and so um, the actual amount of magnetization that's transferred in late time limit um, uh, follows a distribution that's the absolute value of a random walk. So it's not a random walk, it's the absolute value of a random walk. Um, and, um, and so that has a couple of implications. The first is that if you take a Gaussian and you cut out the left half of it, um, then you get a very strongly skewed distribution. So this distribution does not look like Gaussian at late times, it's strongly skewed. And the second thing to notice is that um, the mean and standard deviation of distribution are going to scale the same way. Um, because there's only one parameter setting this thing. It's like you have a random walk, it's got some variance, and just cut off the left half of it. So the mean and the variance are um, locked together. Um, and um, why is that the case? Well, in, the, in, in something like the exclusion process, there's a large number of independently moving random walkers carrying spin, whereas here there's just one gigantic domain wall. There's only one excitation that's doing any of the spin transport, and, um, and so that's, that's, that's why the fluctuations are so much more massive intuitively. Okay, um, and so um, the nice thing about having an exact solution is we can compute all the stuff we like, um, and so, but the, the, key, the key points are the ones that I was making earlier, which is it's very skewed, and the fluctuations are parametrically much bigger than they would be um, in a chaotic um, diffusive system. Okay, um, right, and then um, you can check this um, numerically, and so we've done some of that, and, um, and we've also um, uh, talked to um, Tomas and his group, who've also done um, some of this, um, and it, it all kind of um, hangs together. Um, okay, um, you can also use this picture to go away from um, the limit of um, a big um, imbalance between the left and right halves. In fact, you can compute this um, all the way to equilibrium um, and 
at equilibrium, um, you know, what happens is that, um, yeah, these, these, these frozen patterns are jit uh, jittering around, but the frozen pattern has no net magnetization, um, and, so, um, and so you recover the conventional um, variance uh, that scales as t to the one half, the standard deviation scales as t to the one fourth. But even here, um, you'll notice that the distribution of magnetization transfer across this domain wall is very far from a Gaussian. It's some other universality class of, um, uh, it's, some, it's some other universal function. Um, and I should say that I, I don't think I have a slide about this, that, um, that this, this is not just an artifact of the infinite delta limit. Um, it also holds, um, I would say, in, in the XXZ spin chain, which is integrable, um, at all delta um, bigger than one. Um, the only thing that changes is this diffusion constant, um, which um, diverges um, as, um, as delta approaches one, which is the, Heisenberg, the isotropic Heisenberg model. Um, and, um, and so you can compute the diffusion constant in closed form, um, which is sort of nice because it's very unusual to be able to do that in an interacting many body system. And um, this might be a useful benchmark for various approximate numerical techniques, experimental techniques, um, to see if they're actually getting the dynamics right. Um, but the point is that for all delta bigger than one, you get the same universal function. Um, and in fact, it doesn't strictly rely on integrability because if you have a hard constraint, then even, even if you add noise to the system, the distribution function stays the same. It's just the, um, it's just the overall scale factor that, um, that changes. Um, all right. Um, so, um, so that's what we understand, and that's nice because you understand something that's um, better than not understanding it, I guess. Um, but okay, so um, it, ultimately, um, you want to go towards um, places where experiments can teach us things you can't compute exactly. And so we're already there here um, because um, at the Heisenberg point, um, the techniques we use to compute this distribution function don't work anymore. Um, but Emmanuel Bloch can do the experiment. And he finds um, once again that this distribution um, that he extracts experimentally is um, is um, persistently and strongly skewed um, at um, at the times he can get to, which are in fact better than the times that um, numerics can get to. So it's sort of a case where you're seeing something that um, that um, is um, both theoretically not really understood. Um, and also not really simulable um, at this point. And so, you know, what's going on here, I, I, would, I would love to know, but I mean, it, it provides some more motivation for experiments. Um, all right, um, and so um, I'm pretty much done. So um, I wanted to just remark that if you want to do this kind of thing in um, an experiment um, using in a NIST device, um, you know, you're looking at the, the full number of particles on the left or right half of the system. Um, this has a scalability issue because um, because if you have some rate at which you have decay events, um, that can give you a spurious um, appearance of polarization transfer, even though nothing actually moved across the cut. And so, um, you know, so we have a partial solution to that, which I don't have time to really talk about, but you can use an ancilla to compute um, the current um, moving across um, um, moving across the cut. And so, yeah, that's, that's the story for spin in this simple case. And so the, the lesson here is that there are multiple types of, um, of distribution function, qualitatively different distribution functions that are consistent with um, the exact same um, structure factor. Um, and, um, and so, you know, are there other examples of this? What are the universality classes of, um, of, of full counting statistics? Um, it's a it's it's an open theoretical question, and it's one that um, maybe the next toolbox gives us um, a um, a way into that um, wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, all right, so that's it for me. Thank you. How much do you know about the delta smaller than one case? Nothing um, at all. I mean, you know um, something. We know yeah. we know a few things. So there's um, a particular scaling limit that case that was computed using different methods by um, Ben Doyon. Um, mm -hmm. So um, their transport is ballistic. So if delta is well away from one. Transport is kind of strongly ballistic, and so that becomes um, fairly simple again. You just have to count. You just have to count these like. Um, space-time rays of quasi-particles, and there's, there's a formalism for doing that. Um, delta equals two and bigger than one were complicated because 
um, this ballistic piece that, um, that you'd expect to exist in an integrable system is gone because of, um, because of the screening effect I was talking about. And that's why, that's why this regime was much harder to make sense of. And that's why the isotropic point is still, I'd say, mostly not understood. More questions? <laughs> Sorry, I think I might have asked it as, you, you mentioned some sort of, coming back to something I showed, you mentioned that the numerics would not be as good as the experiment in, in what sense and how do you know? Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's true for all numerics, but like, um, in, in, certainly, this case, in this case, uh, what? For, for what you showed there. On that yeah, one. yeah, exactly. So um, if you try and do, um, if you try and do um, TBD, for example, yeah. um, we um, sort of um, ran out of steam on this full counting statistics being converged. Um, at time scales of order like 20-ish, um, bond dimension went up a few thousand and like numerics went to hell. So, um, you know, maybe there's a better way to do it, but like as of now, like this is living in a regime where, you, where it's doing better than numerics. Yeah, we, we should chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. we do the, we have a trick actually to go cool. for quite long, yeah. So in this um, experiment that you showed and then later, um, then you have this polarization. Mm -hmm. um, if you increase the dissipation, do you expect to see diffusion again? Um, diffusion so you, transport? Oh in, in yeah, no, so, so, that, so the question of what happens when you add diffusion, when you, when you break interability here, like by adding noise yeah. or something, is kind of an amusing one because what happens is that um, at least in short intermediate times, um, you find that um, the diffusion actually turns into subdiffusion, um, and at short to intermediate times, the distribution function scale, scales the same way. It's the same universal form, and there's some much later crossover um, where this becomes um, sort of um, that's set by delta. It's a time scale that's like one over delta, some, or one over delta squared, or something like that, at which you come back to um, regular um, behavior. So the crossovers near integrability are quite subtle in this model. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's right. thank all the speakers in this session and so on.